PA TV presents Live from Prairie Lights, featuring the best authors and poets on the scene today. From up and coming to well established writers from across the globe, you'll see them right here on PA TV. Welcome to Live at Prairie Lights, uh, brought to you by Care UI Radio and Prairie Lights Bookstore. Uh, tonight, as you all know, it's Yi Yun Lee reading from her new collection, Gold Boy, Emerald Girl. These new stories concern lovers and loners. For many of her characters, solace is a form of strength. In the opening novella, Kindness, the narrator serially deserts opportunities for intimacy. In another story, an aged art teacher, Pariahed forever because of a platonic relationship with a student, learns to accept his being alone. Even when writing about love, the great theme of Lee's new collection is isolation. In the story Prison, a woman whose child has died dreads joining her husband in bed at night when they're forced to share their private weeping. In another story, lovers are in fact trustees of each other's seclusion. In Lee's words, they were lonely and sad people, and they would not make each other less sad, but they could, with great care, make a world that would accommodate their loneliness. Leah said, I believe a writer writes to talk to his or her literary heroes, and her new stories are in dialogue with master practitioners of the form. Her characters have Tolstoy in depth and complexity, surprising us the minute we feel they know them, we know them, both affirming and dancing away from our understanding at the same time. She's internalized Chekhov's economy of language and has his dramatist's ear for dialogue. And on every page, the author impresses with her generosity of heart. Her story suggested to Kenzian faith in the deep down goodness of people, even, where, even when they're under duress or doing ugly things. There are no villains in Lee's work, only failed heroes. Lee was raised and educated in Beijing, China. She came to the United States in 1996 not to be a writer, but an immunologist. We were speaking earlier today, she said that she had never written before uh, in English, or really at all. Um, and coming to this wonderful literary town um, where so many people were writing and thinking about writing and talking about writing all the time, she decided to try her hand at it and began actually studying with Jim McPherson in a summer workshop. And from there, went to um, the nonfiction program and the Iowa Writers uh, Workshop. Uh, at the same time, she was in both programs. Really amazing. Um, her debut collection, A Thousand Years of Good Prayers, won the Frank O'Connor International Short Story Award, the Penn Hemingway Award, among others. Her first novel, The Vagrants, won the gold medal from, in the California Book Award for Fiction. She teaches at the University of California, Davis, and is fiction editor for the Literary Quarterly of Public Space. This year, Lee was named by the New Yorker as one of the top 20 writers under the age of 40. Last week, she was one of 23 individuals to win a MacArthur Foundation grant this year. Juno Diaz has said, Lee is extraordinary, a storyteller of the first order. Each tale in this collection is as wild and beautiful and thorny as a heart. Lee inhabits the lives of her characters with such force and compassion that one cannot help but marvel. Please join me in welcoming Yi Yan Lee. There are a lot of people I want to say hi. I see, I see people from half a life ago. <laughs> I saw someone I met in college. I also saw someone I just met when I first came to Iowa. With her child there, smiling, and my niece and my sister and everybody, David, Jim, everybody. So thank you so much for having me. I'm going to read. I'm going to do a little bit of something different from uh, what I usually do. Is I'm going to read my 
I'm going to read the opening of my literary hero, William Travers' novella. And then I'm going to read my novella that talks to his work. So the book is called Night at Alexandra. I'm going to read you the first page. I am a 58-year-old provincial. I have no children. I have never married. Harry, I have the happiest marriage in the world. Please, when you think of me, remember that. That is what I hear most often, and with the greatest pleasure, from messenger's voice, as precisely record as memory allows. Each quizzical intonation reflected in a glance or gesture. I must have replied something heaven knows what. It never mattered, because she never listened. The war had upset the messenger's lives, she being an English woman, and he German. It brought them to Ireland and to Clumberhill, a sanctuary they most certainly would not otherwise have known. She explained to me that she would not have found life comfortable in Hitler's Germany, and her own country would hardly be a haven for her husband. They had thought of Switzerland, but her messenger believed that Switzerland would be invaded, and the United States did not tempt them. No one but I, at that time of an unprepossessing use of 15, ever used their German titles. In the town where I had been born, they were Mr. and Mrs. Messenger. Yet it seemed to me, a factation, I dare say, that in this way we should honor the strangers that they were. So that's Trevor's opening. And I wrote this novella to talk to his novella. So I'm going to reach excerpt from mine so you could hear the two novellas talk to each other. I am a 41-year-old woman living by myself in the same one-bedroom flat where I have always lived in the derelict building of outskirts of Beijing that is threatened to be demolished by government-backed real estate developers. Apart from a trip to a cheap seaside resort taken with my parents the summer I turned five, I have not traveled much. I spent a year in an army camp in central China, but other than that, I have never lived away from home. In college, after a few failed attempts to convince me of the importance of being a community member, my advisor stopped acknowledging my presence and the bed assigned to me was taken over by the five other girls in the dorm and their trunks. I have not married and naturally have no children. I have few friends, though as I have never left the neighborhood, I have enough acquaintances, most of them a generation or two older. Being around them is comforting. Never is there a day when I feel that I am alone in aging. I teach mathematics in the middle school. I do not love my students or my job. But I have noticed that even the most meager attention I give to the students is returned by a few of them with respect and gratitude and sometimes inexplicable infatuation. I pity those children more than I appreciate them as I can see where they're heading in their lives. It is a terrible thing, you see, even for an indifferent person like me, to see the bleakness lurking in someone else's life. I have no hobby that takes me outside my flat during my spare time. I do not own a television set, but I have a room full of books at least half a century older than I am. I've never, le I've never hurt a soul in my life, or if I've done any harm unintentionally. The pain I inflicted was the most trivial kind, forgotten the moment it was felt, if indeed it could be felt in any way. But that cannot be a happy life, or much of a life at all, you might say. That may very well be true. Why are you unhappy? 
To this day, if I close my eyes, I can feel Lieutenant Wei's finger under my chin, lifting my face to a spring night. Tell me, how can we make you happy? The questions put to me 23 years ago have remained unanswerable. Though it no longer matters, as you see, Lieutenant Wei died three weeks ago. At 46, mother of a teenage daughter, wife of a stationary merchant, veteran of Unit 20256, People's Liberation Army, from which she retired at 43, already afflicted with a malignant tumor. She was made her way in a funeral announcement. I do not know why the news of her death was mailed to me, except perhaps the funeral committee thought I was one of her long lost friends. My name scribbled in an old address book. I wonder if the, I wonder if the announcement was sent to the other girls, though not many of them would still be at the same address. I remember the day Lieutenant Wei's wedding invitation arrived in a distant past, and thinking then that it would be the last time I would hear from her. I did not go to the funeral, as I had not gone to her wedding both of which took place two hours by train from Beijing. It is a hassle to travel for a wedding, but more so for a funeral. One has to face strangers' tears and words. One has to repeat words of condolence to irrelevant people. When I was five, a peddler came to our neighborhood one Sunday with a bamboo basket full of spring chicks. I was trading behind my father for our weekly shopping of ration food, and when the petter put a chick in my palm, its small body soft and warm and shivering constantly, I cried before I could ask my father to buy it for me. We were not a rich family. My father worked as a janitor, and my mother, ill for as long as I could remember, did not work. And I learned early to count coins and small bills with my father before we set out to shop. It must have been a painful thing for those who knew our story to watch my father's distress, as two women offered to buy two chicks for me. My father, on the way home, warned me gently that the chicks were too young to last more than a day or two. I built a nest of, I built a nest of <coughs> out of a shoebox and ripped newspaper, and fed them water soap and meat grains, and a day later, when they looked ill, aspirin dissolved in water. Two days later, they died. The one I named Dot and marked with ink on his forehead, the first one to go, followed by mushroom. I stole two eggs from the kitchen, but my father went to help a neighbor fix the leaking sink. My mother was not often around in those days. I cracked the eggs carefully and washed away the yolks and whites. But no matter how hard I tried, I could not fit the chicks back into the shells. And I can see to this day the half shell on Dot's head, covering the ink spot like a funny little hat. I have learned since then that life is like that, each day ending up like a chick refusing to, re to be returned to the egg shell. So that's the opening when this woman started to talk. A little bit more of her talking. A dream has occurred repeatedly over the past 20 years in which I have to give up my present life and return to the army. Always Lieutenant Wei is in the dream. In the early years, she would smile cruelly at me. Didn't I tell you that you would be back? The question was put to me in various ways, but the coldness remained the same. The dreams had become less wicked as the years gone by. I'm back, I tell Lieutenant Wei. I always knew you have I always knew you would come back, she replies. We're older, having aged in my dreams as we have in real life. The only remnants of a previous life among a group of cherry teenage girls. These dreams upset me. Lieutenant Wei's marriage two years after I had left the army and her transfer to another city 
which would know her only as a married woman and later a mother, and then would see her die, must have wiped her history clean so she could start collecting new memories, not about young, miserable girls in the camp, but about happy people who deserve to be remembered. I never showed up in her dreams, I'm certain, as people we keep in our memories rarely have a place for us in theirs. You may say that in turn we too, you may say that we too evict people from our hearts while we continue living theirs. And that may very well be true. But I wonder if I am an anomaly in that respect. I have never forgotten a, a person who has come into my life, and perhaps it is for that reason I cannot have much of a life myself. The people I carry with me have lived out not only their own rations, but mine too. Though they are innocent usurpers of my life, and I have only myself to blame. For instance, there's Professor Shan. She was in her early 60s and I was 12 when she approached me one September evening. I was on my way to the milk station. Do you have a minute, she said. I looked down at the two empty bottles snuggled in the little carrier my father had woven for me. He had painted the dried reed different colors and the basket had an intricate pattern, though by then the colors had all paled. My father had a pair of hands that were good at making things, the wooden packs he put on the foyer wall for my school satchel and coat had red beaks and black eyes. The cardboard wardrobe had two windows that you could push open from inside. He had built my bed too, a small wooden one, painted orange, just big enough to fit in the foyer alongside the wardrobe. We lived in a small one-bedroom unit, the room itself serving as my parents' bedroom, the foyer my bedroom. There was a small cube of kitchen and a smaller cube of a bathroom next to the foyer. Later it occurred to me that we could not afford much furniture but when I was young, I thought it was a hobby of my father's to make things with his own hands. Once upon a time, he must have made things for my mother too, but from the time my memory begins, the bedroom had two single beds, my father's bear neatly made, and my mother's piled with old novels. Do you have a minute I'm asking you? The old woman said again. I was on the way to the milk station, I stammered. I'll wait for you here, she said, tapping on the face of her wristwatch with a long finger. Professor Shan's place, a one-room unit also, seemed more crowded than ours, even though she lived there by herself. Apart from a table, chair, and a single bed, the room was filled with trunks, dark leather ones with intricate patterns on the tops and sides, wooden ones with rusty metal clips, and two matching trunks, once bleached but by then more yellow than white, made of bamboo or perhaps straw, I couldn't tell which. On each trunk there were books. She moved a pile of books to make a spot for me to sit on her single bed, and then took a seat in the only chair. Up to that point I had not studied her, but realized now that she was a beautiful woman, even at her age. Her hair, grayish-white, was combed into a tight bun, not a single strand running loose. Her face, the high cheekbones, the very prominent forehead, and the deep-set eyes reminded me of a photograph of a female Soviet pilot in my textbook. I wondered if Professor Shan had mixed blood. It was a secret joy of mine to study people's faces. I must take after my mother who, apart from studying my face at mealtimes, rarely took a bite. Sometimes waiting for us to finish eating, she would comment on the people passing by outside the window. Oily and puffy as fresh fried dough, she described a woman leaving a floor above us. The man next door had a long, bitter-looking face like a cucumber. My mother was the prettiest woman I had known until then, with almond-shaped eyes and a small, heart-shaped face, a straight and delicate nose, and, as I later learned from her collection of romantic novels from the early 1900s, a, a cherry petal mouth. 
When she grew tired of watching the world, she would study her own face in the oval mirror. A princess trapped in the fate of a handmaiden, she would say to no one in particular. My father, eating silently, would look up at her with an apologetic smile, as if he were a parent responsible for his child's deformed body. My father had married late in his life, my mother early, he at 50 and she at 20. Two years later, they had me, their only child. When I was in elementary school, other children often mistook him as my grandfather, but perhaps that was because he had to be a parent to my mother too. Together, my mother and I made my father grow old fast. You could see that in his stooped back and sad smile. And just skip a page. Professor Shan studied me while I looked around the room, then picked up an old book and turned to a random page. Read the line to me, she said. The book was the first one in a series called Essential English, which Professor Shan had used to learn English 50 years ago. The page had a small cartoon of a child on a seat, the kind one would find in a luxurious theater. In the cartoon, the child, who was not heavy enough to keep the seat from folding back, smiled uncertainly on his high perch, and I felt the same. I had entered middle school earlier that month and had barely learned my alphabet. When I could not read the caption, Professor Shan put the book back with the other volumes, their spines different colors that were equally faded. You do know that you are not your parents' first daughter, don't you? She turned and faced me. And you do know that no matter how nicely they treat you, they can't do much for your education, don't you? I had not dotted my blood until then. I knew that my parents were different from most parents, but I had thought that it was their age difference and my mother's illness. Mo Yin, my mother sometimes said my name in a soft voice when my father was not around, and I would know that she had some secrets to tell me. A man can have a children until he's 70, she would say. A woman's use ends the moment she marries. Mo Yan, do not let a man touch you here and here, she would say, gesturing vaguely toward her own body. Mo Yan, your father would get your stepmother the moment I died, she would say, narrowing her eyes in an amused way. Do you know that I cannot die because I don't want you to live and their stepmother? In one of those revelatory moments, she could have said, Mo Yin, you were not born to us. We only picked you up from a garbage dump. But no, my mother had never, even in her most uncharitable, uncharitable moments, said that to me. And in fact, she kept secret until her death. And for that alone, I loved her and love her still. If your parents haven't told you this, someone else must. Professor Shan said when I did not reply. One needs to know where she came from, do you understand? That's her first encounter with Professor Shan. I'll read a little bit about the parents again. So you know a little bit of the backstory. When I entered elementary school, I had been instructed by my father to put down retired early from illness for my mother's occupation. What kind of illness? The teachers would ask. What did she do before she became ill? At first, I did not know how to answer. But by middle school, I became an expert in dealing with people's curiosity. She was a bookkeeper, I would say the most tedious and lonely job I could come up with for my mother. Lupus was what had been troubling her, I would explain. The name of the disease learned in fifth grade when a classmate's mother had died from it. I thought about what kind of, t I'm sorry, that's not a line, okay. The earliest I could remember people commenting on her illness was when I was four. I was standing in a long line waiting for a monthly rack reaction while my father crossed the street to buy rice. 
What kind of parents would leave a child that small to hold a place in line? Asked someone who must have been new to the neighborhood. And a woman, not far behind me, replied that my mother was a mental case. Nymphomania was the word Professor Shan had used. And it was from her that I had learned the story of my parents' marriage. At 19, my mother had fallen in love with a married man who had recently moved into the neighborhood. And when he claimed that he had nothing to do with her fantasy, she ran into the street, calling his name and telling people she had aborted three babies for him. They would have locked her up permanently had it not been for my father's marriage proposal. My father, who people had thought would remain a bachelor for life, came to my mother's parents and asked to take the burden off their hands. Which would you have chosen for your daughter had you been a mother? Professor Shan asked me. An asylum when an old man. She told me the story not long after I had become a regular visitor to her flat. I had stammered not knowing how to pass the test. Professor Shen said that it was my mother's good fortune that her parents had given her up to a man who loved her rather than to the asylum. Love makes a man blind, she added. And I wondered if my father's misfortune was transparent to the world. So she started to visit Professor Shen. And I'm going to read one passage about what they did together in the professor's apartment. Mm -hmm. Let me see if I have that here. If not. So I'll start here. The professor started to read English novels to her. We had, we had spent 10 months with David Copperfield, slowly at first two or three pages a day, and later five or six pages. I don't remember at what point I had begun to understand what was read to me, in bits of, and pieces, of course. It must be similar to the moment a child first understands the world in words, when what is spoken to her has not yet taken on a definite meaning, but she becomes more confident each day that there is a message behind those jumbled sounds. I told my parents that I had been visiting Professor Shan as she had agreed to tutor me, a lie that my father had not questioned and my mother had not bothered to listen to. I did not tell Professor Shan that I had begun to understand her, but surely she saw the change. Perhaps my eyes wandered less often to the trees outside the window, or perhaps my face betrayed an eagerness when there before was only ignorance. In any case, Two-thirds into the novel, she stopped translating for me. Neither of us talked about the change of routine. I was quiet, still intimidated by her, though I'd begun to look forward to the hours spent in her flat. She had not begun to tell me her stories. That would come later. I had not begun to share her attachment to books. That too would, be, that too would come later, much later perhaps, only after I stopped visiting her. Still, her fifth floor flat, where life did not seem to be lived out in measuring of rice and flour or the counting of small bills and coins, at least during the time I was there, became a place and no other place could be. Strangers, closer to my heart than my neighbors and acquaintances, loved tragic and strange loves and died tragic and strange deaths. And Professor Shen's unperturbed voice made it all seem natural. After David Copperfield, we read Great Expectations, then The Return of the Native, and later Tess of the Burvilles. It was during the Jew the Obscure that she began to tell me her story, in fragments I would piece together later. Sometimes the story came at the beginning of the afternoon, sometimes when she took a break from reading a novel to me. She never talked long about herself, and afterwards we did not discuss it. I had become less nervous around her. Still, I did not talk much about my life at school or at home. Intuitively, I knew she had little interest in the life I lived outside the hour in her flat. So that's her. She started this strange 
friendship with Professor Shan? <coughs> started reading after Dickens and, and Hardy. She started to read D. H. Lawrence to her. And it was during Lawrence that she parted way with the professor because she could not, there was something about the woman that made her very uneasy. So she ran away from the old woman. While she was running away, she stole a copy of D. H. Lawrence's stories. And at 18, she went to the army camp and she brought the Lawrence stories with her, and she would read Lawrence stories. She would try to imagine the professor's voice reading those words to her. And while in the army, her, her, fellow, her fellow soldier, there was this young woman who got hold of a copy of Lady Chatterley's Lover, which was banned in China at the time. So the young woman gave the narrator this copy and asked her to read the novel from the beginning to the end and marked every sex scene in the novel so the other woman could have a sex education without having to read the novel. <laughs> so, so Mo Yan, the narrator, started to read Lady Chatterley's Lover in the army and she was caught by Lieutenant Wei who she talked about at the beginning of the, of the story. So she had a strange sort of, you know, intense friendship with the officer too, which went on and on, of course. So I'm going to skip the whole part about the officer because it's just too complex, but I'm going to come back to the, to the parents. So while she was in the army, she got a telegraph saying her mother died. So she came back from the camp just going to read you two more pages about her parents. My father looked a very old man, his eyes hollow, his hands shaking constantly, the grief too heavy. He had turned 70 the day before my mother's death, a suicide I had guessed at once, though he did not tell me what she had done. It was from neighbors that I had found out. She had hanged herself in the bedroom. Anybody else would have broken that curtain rod with her weight, but of course your mother was so skinny, an old woman said to me, as if my mother's only misfortune was that she had never become a nicely plump woman. Your mother was the kindest woman in the world, my father said the night before her cremation. He was lying in bed, his head propped up by a stack of pillows my mother had used when she read. I told him to eat a little and then rest, but the noodle soup I had made for him remained untouched, and he insisted on watching me pack up my mother's side of the bedroom. Her clothes, many of them from her youth, would be cremated with her. Her collection of romantic novels and ancient poetry I was to put into boxes and move out to the foyer with me. She was never happy to be married to an old man, he said, but she kept her promise. I did not know what promise my father was talking about, but I knew I need not press him for any explanation. In the past two, year, in the past two days, he had talked more than he had for years. Stories of my mother's childhood and youth of being the middle daughter sandwiched between many siblings and feeling neglected by her parents, of her loving books despite her parents' decision to send her to a factory as an apprentice at 15, of her favorite three-legged cat named San San, of her delight in painting her fingernails with the petals of blossoms every spring, red, pink, or lavender, depending on which color was blooming in her best friend's gardens. All this was related to me. <coughs> I wondered if my mother had told my father these stories in the early years of their marriage, but she had already been a mad woman then, so how could he have been certain that she was not just making up those tales the same way she had made up her love story with a married man? She asked me if 20 years was enough, my father said after a moment. 20 years was a long time for an older man like me, I told her. So she said, let's be husband and wife for 20 years. 
People said I was out of my mind to marry a mad woman, but you see, she was only unhappy. She did not break her promise. I wondered if my mother had calculated all out. An older man in love with her was better than an asylum, or the reign of her disgraced parents and siblings. But no matter, she had returned his kindness. With 20 years of a life, she had no desire to live. Of course, it's not fair for you, my father said. I thought 20 years was enough time to bring up a child together. She did not want you at first. Why did she agree? A child gives a marriage a future. That was what people told me. I thought when we had you, she would forget that foolish deal of 20 years, my father said. I'm sorry we haven't had much to offer you as parents. I turned my back to my father, pretending to pick up another stack of books so he would not see my tears. Neither he nor I, in the end, had given my mother more reason to live than the obligation to fulfill a simple promise. Though even in her maddest years, she had never given up the pretense that she was my birth mother. I wished Professor Shan had never told me about my adoption. The next day, my father and I saw my mother up at the funeral home. There was no memorial service for her, nor did any of her siblings come and acknowledge her departure. My father insisted on waiting by the furnace alone, so I wandered into one of the meeting halls and sat through a memorial service for a stranger. On the bus ride home, my father carried a wooden box, inside of which was an ivory-colored silk bag that contained what was left of my mother. I had tried to convince him to bury her, but, she had ref but he had refused. He wanted to be buried with her on the same day, he explained to me. Not, ri not right next to her, he said, since she had fulfilled her promise and he should fulfill his of leaving her alone. But also not too far from her, he added after a moment. I'm sorry we have to burden you, my father said when I said nothing about he re his request. I knew that he had guessed by then that I had found out about my adoption, as one's birth father would not have to apologize for his last own request. So that's the father. I'm going to read a little bit more. The last part. Well, after her mother died, she did not return to the army, so she would just wander around the neighborhood. A few weeks after I had come home, I was standing by the roadside and watching workers brush the trunks of elm trees with white paint mixed with pesticide when Professor Shan approached me. I see that you are back, she said. Come with me. I had not been to Professor Shan's flat since I had left her, yet from the look of things, time had stopped in her world. I heard about your mother's passing, Professor Shan said. Is your father doing all right? A few days earlier, my father had asked me if I thought he had been responsible for my mother's death. Would she have had a longer life if he had not married her, he asked me. And I assured her, him that my mother, despite her unhappiness, loved him as she had, ne she had never loved anyone else. Love leaves one in debt, Professor Shan said. I nodded, though I wondered whether she meant that my father was forever paying back his debt to my mother because of his love for her, or that being loved and unable to love back had made her indebted to him. Better if you stay free from all that, do you understand, Professor Shan said. I had read enough love stories to be interested in one more, I said and Professor Shen seemed satisfied by my answer. After that, I resumed my daily visit to her flat, and I continued for the next tw 12 years. At the beginning, she read to me, and later, when her eyesight deteriorated, I took over, though she was always the one to tell me which book to read. 
She never asked me about my life in the army, and she showed little interest in the civilian life I had led in college and later as a school teacher. When I reached marriage age, people began to press me, subtly at first and later less so, saying that a young woman's best years were brief, saying that I was becoming less desirable by the day. Professor Shan must have suspected all this talk, but as always, she refused to let the mundane into her flat. Instead, we read other people's stories, more real than our own. After all, inadequate makers of our own life, we were no match for those masters. My father died less than a year after my mother, after I met my mother, and against his wish, I buried their urns next to each other. I visit them every year on my birthday, my only trip outside the district where I live and teach. My mother fell in love at an early age. My father late. They both fell for someone who would not return their love, yet in the end, their story is the only love story I can claim. And I live as a proof of that story, of one man's offering to a woman from his meager existence and of her returning it with her entire adult life. I think I'm going to stop there. <laughs> Thank you. I think I would be happy to end. I think it's Q&A time. Is that 10 minutes, 10 minutes of Q&A if you have questions? Yes. What reading courses did I take at workshop? I took a lot of Maryland's, <laughs> I took Maryland's Bible and uh, Moby Dick, Faulkner. I, I think I had, I might have missed Faulkner because I was pregnant. I took James mythology class and what else? I think, yeah, those are about what I remembered. I remember a lot about Maryland. <laughs> There's, what do you think of the movie adaptation of your stories? Uh, how do you it? It was screened at the Singapore International Film Festival last year. Oh. It was quite well received. So oh, thank you. you. So, yeah, so two stories from, I can give you a longer answer. Two stories from my first collection, A Thousand Years of Good Prayers and, and Princess of Nebraska, were made into films. They were made into like a doublet or a pair of films by Wayne Wan, who also made the Joy Luck Club and, you know, who adapted. Pastors that smoke. I had a lot of fun working with him, only because I never watch films. <laughs> I'm a very, I'm a very bookish person, so I would rather read books than watching films. So, I adapted a thousand years good prayers for him, and I learned a lot about storytelling when I did the screenplay because. When he approached me, he said I wanted to make a. He said he wanted to make a film, and I, I told him I said that story cannot be made into a film because it's a very internal story. Nothing happens in that story. Really, nothing happens. And it's very interesting. I mean, just to see how a filmmaker's mind works. He said, well, he said I marked your story. It's a like 20-page story. He said there are six days and seven nights in your story. I was very shocked because I did <laughs> not write with six days and seven nights. And he said, go home and find the six days and seven nights. So I went home, I marked, I mean, I tried to mark six days and seven nights. And I really was that structure in mind I started to write. But I, when I write fiction, I don't imagine. I mean, I don't envision, I, mean, I do imagine, but I don't envision people. So the first draft I showed him, he said, he called me, he said, well, this is not a screenplay, this is a radio play. <laughs> because my character just, because I did not know how to write screenplay, so my characters talk all the time. And this is the second thing I learned from him. He said, you know, he said, I want 40% of silence time in your film. He said, only when you have 40% of silence time, the actors can act. And he, I, I learned a lot from that, just that one thing I learned so much. So I went home and did 40% of silent time. It, in the end, it is really when the characters don't talk, they, they, they convey by their, by their faces or you know, their body language. So, so I had a lot of fun working with that. And the, the Princess of Nebraska was completely 
moved from Nebraska to San Francisco, <laughs> which is Wayne's hometown, which I know not as much as Wayne does. So I did not write the screenplay. And he did not have a screenplay either. It was an experiment he shot without a screenplay. So I had fun. I think you know it's interesting to see people you imagine coming alive on stage. I mean, on the screen. It's a very strange experience. Um, what time period does um, Gold Boy, Emerald Girl take place in? Like, I heard you mention a war. Oh, what time is this? I mean, this is a collection of stories, and I would say most of the stories take place in contemporary China. Okay. Would it be in the past 20 years when, you know, internet is there, you know, everything is there, so. Yes. Why do you write? Why do I write? That's such a good question. <laughs> I feel that I can never answer that question. <laughs> I'm trying to find something profound to say, but I really have nothing profound in my mind. I think I, I'm happy when I write, and I'm extremely grumpy when I'm not writing. <laughs> so for my happiness, or for the happiness of my children, I need to write. <laughs> In the vagrants, you wrote about some very dark things. So you seem to be a very happy person, and husband, and two children. And where do you find all that, uh, all the demons? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a very good person. I looked very happy. I'm a sad person in the closet. <laughs> I just have, I haven't come out of that closet to become a sad person. So, well, happiness. It's always the surface. You know, I, I, I don't think, I'm not saying I'm not happy, but I think happiness doesn't concern me in fiction because happiness could be a simplified version of life. I mean, darkness too is, it could be simplified because that's the other end of, you know, happiness. I think between happiness and darkness, between black and white, there are different shades of greatness. You know, I think I, those, it's those grayness, those gray areas that I, that I write for. So where do these things come from? If you go out to the world, if someone tells you he's happy, right away you have to question that. You know, nobody tells you when he's happy. They, they have to lie. They, they always lie to you. So I just go around my life trying to detect, I mean, a lie detector. <coughs> I'm really a lie detector. I try, to, I try to find when people lie to me. And people lie all the time. <laughs> yeah. And it's always, fascinating for me. I mean, to be able to s tell when people lie to you. And most people lie horribly. Sometimes people lie really well. But if you can detect those lies, even better. So that's how I spend my days. <laughs> I, just <laughs> I really just, and I think that that is extremely satisfying. And when you get used to that practice, you start to see through people much more easily than I don't know, than before, I think. So I actually told my students, go home, you know, try to see if your parents or your boyfriends or your girlfriends are lying to you. <laughs> <laughs> That's when interesting things happen. Can you talk a little bit about your, your switch from a scientist to a writer? Were you really a writer at heart and lying to yourself uh, about being a scientist? Yes. So how did I become a writer from a scientist? You know, in a way, I think my life was chosen for me when I was younger because I was smart. I was, you know, a mathematics prodigy. So, and my parents very much wanted me to go into science. So I really did not have any decision. I mean, it was not my decision. But of course, you know, we were trying early on, you know, if you carry on something, you have to carry it to the end. So, you know, so I was sort of good, you know, I was not dedicated, but good. But again, this is what happens in Iowa City. You send a scientist to Iowa City, <laughs> and the scientist <laughs> crossed the river to become a writer. I really fell in love with writing when I started writing. I fell in love with both writing and English language, and, you know, both them they got together to become a new passion for me. So it's, it was actually not very hard to give up science. You know, it's hard to give up all your education, you know, your dream. Like I used to dream to become Madame Curie of China, when that dream was long gone. But on the other hand, I just, I, I feel that I'm just 
very happy telling stories, writing stories. So it's not a very hard decision. Yeah. Oh, I found that uh, all of your uh, books published are written in English, and but and your mother language is Chinese, and uh, many of the stories you read uh, is based on your Chinese experience. Mm -hmm. So do you plan to write books in Chinese if possible in the future? So I write in English, and I write mostly about China. Do I plan to write in Chinese? Is that what you request? No, because for a very simple reason, I have never written in Chinese. And English, even though it's my second language, it is my first language in writing. And once you, like, once I started writing English, it's harder to imagine writing in Chinese. So I, w I would, no, I don't think I would do that. And partly, you know, I think every day, I think in English. I process things and I read most of English, but I count in Chinese. I do my math in Chinese. <laughs> so those are the things I carry on from my childhood on. But I think writing is very much connected to English, so I don't think Chinese is my written lang writing language. So do, you, do you think, is there any, a disadvantage yes. Chinese? No, it's not the disadvantage of Chinese. It's more about which language I feel more comfortable. I feel more comfortable with English. And it's rather a very, I don't know, it's just a decision that once made, I will just carry on with this decision and I feel pretty satisfied writing in English. So there's no, nothing against Chinese language. It's just one person's decision. Um, does your training as a scientist affect the process of your writing? Mm -hmm. Very good question. Did my training as a scientist affect my writing or in any way? I used to be very mathematical when I write, when I wrote. When I was in the workshop, I, I told some students this morning that if I imagine the story would be as like 15 pages, and the story would be 15 pages. <laughs> and if I imagine, you know, a turn at the one third of the story on page five, I make sure it happens. <laughs> it's actually a very it's a way to control your material. I realized later, now I don't do that, but I realized it was at the time I needed to control my story in the way that mathematics actually was becoming a very good way to control your story. I like to look at the shape of stories. I often, t I often teach uh, a few stories. One story is by Mark Bernard Malamed. It's called The Bill. It's, again, that story is so well done because it's all about geometry of the human world. <laughs> so you can you see a one street, a couple here, and a couple here. The street is a mirror image, and the two couples, you know, mirror each other. So those are what I used to look at, you know, geometry and mathematics. And I no longer do that because, again, you know, writing becomes more fluid as I write more. <laughs> So, to, how do you go back to China to get more of your material? In what way do you accumulate your material? What, yes, good question. So what way do I accumulate my material? Well, one thing, there's an internet. <laughs> Thank God there's an internet. I just advised students not to use internet. I actually went on internet free last summer and I, I read so many Russian novels. I reread complete, you know, Tolstoy and Tolstoyevsky and Chekhov, and very good. But I, you know, I think the material. The, there are two parts to that question. Is you know, one is situations. Many stories in the in the book are about Chinese situations, or situations you would find in today's China. And those situations, you can read it in the newspaper. I talk to my parents or friends, they would tell me stories. And those are enough to, you know, to gather a lot of situations for me. But then there is the part that you, know, you cannot rely on anyone, which is your imagination. You have to imagine characters to live up to those situations. And characters come from me and from reading not probably not Chinese, I mean any literature, we still read Dickens because we understand his characters. We read Jane Austen. I always say, you know, human nature evolved so slowly that, you know, people 200 years ago, 300 years ago felt the same as we do today. So I think that you don't need to gather, you just try to understand human nature. And once you know human nature really well, you can just 
have a new situation and you put the same characters in the new situation, they would have a new story. <laughs> so, so that's what I do. I hate to interrupt. I think we're at the 8 o'clock hour, so if you have more questions, uh, you will be oh. signing in the cafe. There's going to be a little celebration there, I think. Yes. <laughs> so. Oh, there it is. I'm sorry, Jan, I stole your line. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure everybody Oh, okay, so the signing will be in the next room, too. Thank you very much for coming.